Ankylizing spondylitis has a lot of similarities to rheumatoid falling in the inflammatory arthritis category, and it can be debilitating, awful. And a lot of the same medications that are used for rheumatoid are used for ankylizing spondylitis. We want to help people with all forms of inflammatory arthritis conditions by sharing success stories from those who have overcome very challenging situations and have put themselves back in the driver's seat and have regained control and confidence over their condition. So today I've got Simon all the way from Belgium, who's got a fabulous story for us about his transformation with ankylizing spondylitis. He has not done the Patterson program or the rheumatoid solution system. He has discovered most of this on his own and has ended up with the same approach virtually by continuing to trial and error and paying attention to the research and watching podcasts, including this one, and learning and implementing over many years. So Simon, it's a pleasure to have you here. And I can't wait to hear about your journey in detail. But first of all, tell us the sort of before and after how bad you were and then how you feel right now. Thank you, Clint. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I would also like to start by saying thank you for all the work you're doing for uh, people with uh, rheumatoid arthritis and AS, like myself. Um, so basically, the AS was is has always sort of been a part of my life. And um, at one point, I started waking up with pain in the morning from it. Um, it dictated most of my day um, in the sense that it took away a lot of my energy. And that was always on my mind as well. And uh, but that has disappeared for a large part now. So I can say that I now I'm not dominated by the disease anymore, but it's it's part of my life, but it's very, very manageable for me. And I can do everything I want to do. Uh, and even more, it has pushed me to do things that I might not have done otherwise. So in that regard, I think it's um, yeah an important part of my life that negative and also positive things have come from and i i used to take uh, the biologics um and now um i've completely stopped doing that and i just rely on the lifestyle um and the health choices to manage the as we talked just before we hit record here and i want to share with the audience what we're in for you've got a substantial list here of things that have helped you tremendously and that you kind of use as your non-negotiables of, of how to keep pain low. And we're going to go through each one of those um, and, and, and then we'll, we'll sort of exchange our experiences on both yeah. of those to provide as much insights of how we utilize these strategies uh, for everyone. Um, and, I don't. I almost don't want to say, but first, because it's just as important, though, is your discovery of each one of these. So let's work through in that order. Uh, you have had it for a long time. I think you were diagnosed around 21 years old. Can you take us back to what that felt like? I imagine you wanted to be just uh, hanging out with your friends and and maybe trying to, you know, have have a fun social life. And suddenly you you've been diagnosed with something like that. I mean, what was that moment like? Um, actually for me, the first time someone, a doctor mentioned this to me, like he was really, um, serious and, and, and oh, yeah, I think you have a very serious disease and, and I didn't really want to believe him. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's fine. It will probably not, not that bad. And I, I've had back pain for most of my life and it's, I can manage and whatever. Um, so it was a bit yeah, for me, it took a while for me to accept the fact that I have this disease. Um, I've, I had been prescribed with um, anti-inflammatory drug um, drugs for a while before the actual diagnosis. Um, and I kept taking those for a while. Um, and it took a while for me to start the journey into how am I going to get or, or live with this kind of pain that I that I have. It didn't really, um, I wasn't like bedridden or anything. I just, I started waking up from the pain in the morning, um, which was annoying. And then I had some pain for the first few hours of the day. And it was always kind of lingering afterwards. 
Um, but maybe, yeah, for, it, it, it didn't, it wasn't like at 21, this started for me. I was always, I always had like a week back since I was 14. Um, I even remember a teacher, uh, a swimming teacher at one point telling my parents, I think there's something wrong with his back because he's, he's kind of crooked um, when he swims. And that started a whole physio thing. And I've, since I was 14 or so, I've always been going to the physio, doing exercises for my back, going to the fitness. It, it has always been a part of my, of my life. Um, I've always had to deal with this lower back pain. Um, so when the doctor said, yeah, I think it's really serious. I think it's, it's, uh, AS, um, yeah, it was just another name for it really for me. Um, but then the, I had to take more and more anti-inflammatory drugs, which started, you know, having an effect on my uh, gut, um, on my energy, on on everything basically. And it's also a bit part because in my family, my mother has has um, a, some form of, of rheumatoid arthritis, um, not very um, heavy, but she does uh, have it. My father has um, the uh, the skin uh, disease. Um, so psoriasis. Yes. So it's in my family. So I knew there's probably a big chance that this is correct and that I have this. Um, and then I started seeing some more um, uh, rheumatoid um, doctors, so specialists, um, who also said, yeah, probably we did a, a blood. So they did a blood research, they confirmed. And then um, actually one of them put me on a trial for biologics. Because at that point, they weren't that common yet. Um, this is uh, 22 years ago now. Um, and I started taking Embrel. I don't know if you, you know that, but there are so shots every week that I had to do, which is a pretty major intervention, <laughs> I thought, at that point. Um, but I, yeah, it did help. Um, so for the first few years, I sort of managed with these shots the back pain in the morning went away during the day i still had some discomfort and it was always a little annoying and it was always there and it was it's always you know it's it's always been a thing it's always sort of connected to me oh no simon yeah he has back pain right so and that went on for some years i've always sort of done sports and fitness and, and moving because I did feel uh, or I did um, see that that helped me, right? So when I was moving and when I did sports and when I, I always felt better. Also, the back pain went away. And when I was doing sports, I never had to think about the back pain, right? It wasn't there. So that was very, very fun for me. So I did a lot of sports, played volleyball for a long time. Um, but then at, I think like, so stop me if this is going too long. Eh? No, no, I, I, I've, I've sort of, I'm accumulating sort of things to add and to comment on and questions yeah. as you're going in my mind. But one, let me, let me share one of those. Uh, one of the most dramatic recoveries from ankylosing spondylitis that I've ever participated uh, with or, or played a role in, I've never shared um, on our podcast because she, the woman was um, uh, a little bit shy and didn't want to share. Um, but uh, the number one strategy that we used when I was doing sort of one-to-one -one work with her was exercise. And I said, what are you going to do? You're going to do three Bikram yoga classes a week and every other day you're going to go to the pool and you're going to swim laps. And so she began doing these exercises in those formats that she hadn't done before uh prior to us working together she couldn't get in and out of the car her back mm -hmm. hurt so much she couldn't get into the driver's seat and, and so on uh, and at the end of a six-month period uh, she was so good that she felt like she didn't even have the the condition anymore mm -hmm. and yes diet played its role but it was this commitment to movement that mm. i felt were the stronger of the two so i just wanted to add that uh that example I completely i think that's completely true um this is this is the part where it really started to find the solution for me so when i was 35 um i discovered crossfit which is basically moving every day 
right? So I started doing this every day and I forgot about taking my medication. I just, it just went out of, I didn't have to, I, the pain was gone. I didn't think about it anymore. And then I realized, oh shit, I didn't do, oh, sorry. I realized I didn't take my shot this week, but I didn't have to. I didn't feel anything. It wasn't, I was, I felt great. I was moving. I, this is a bit, the problem that I have with the doctors was they always gave these really annoying exercises you had to do to strengthen your back. But it's it's always such an annoying thing, and you have to lie, you have to do this for half an hour every day. And but CrossFit, it was fun, you know. You got to do it for an hour. I didn't. I was. I felt great. I had a lot of energy, and that sort of started this whole journey for me, right? So the more I moved, the better I felt. And then I started looking into okay, if this works, what else can help me? Right. And I have to say the community around the CrossFit has really, really helped me in discovering these things. So it started at like 35 and then went off into this. I, I went off into this really research, trying to find everything that, that, that could help me. Um, and one of the first things was next to the movement is then, of course, what you eat. Right. Because for CrossFit, if you do a lot of CrossFit, you have to eat a lot. <laughs> and if you want to, yeah, it was a bit from the. From the muscle side, if you want to gain muscles, you have to eat a lot of, of things, right? But then the thing I, I, I discovered was I started eating a lot of carbs because I wanted to bulk up. Yeah, but the typical uh, story maybe. But, but then I felt that my energy was not so great anymore. So um, at that time, keto was very um, uh, prominent as a strategy as well. So I started trying that. And I, I did feel, okay, this is good for my energy, right? I can keep doing the movement. I can, I can even do more. Um, so not too many carbs. Great. Um, also found Tim Ferriss at that point who had a low carb diet that he prescribed, um, which worked really, really well for me. So I started fine tuning this a bit, but I've always sort of been on the low carb side. Uh, so a lot of fats. I do eat fruit which I know is carbs and, and sugar, but I, it doesn't really, um, I mean, for me, that doesn't cause any problems. Um, although some forms like weirdly apples don't really agree with me. I don't know why. Um, so I started using a CGM as well to see, okay, which kind of foods work well for me, which raise my blood sugar, um, very much. Um, and then sort of decided on, okay, this is my diet that works really well for me, which is low carb, which is a lot of vegetables, a lot of, um, yeah, so, um, not, not, uh, one, one problem that I have is I'm a really, I have a sweet tooth. So I eat a lot of candy and, and cookies. And I used to do that in the past really a lot. Um, it's sort of a family disease. A lot of people in my family are overweight. And when I cut that out and like the, the, the pre-made stuff, that also made a huge difference. So just mm. the organic foods, the, the, the homegrown things, the, the veg, a lot of lots and lots of vegetables that really started me on, on another, um, really that, that put me on another level for my health. So the assumption is that when you start to reduce the carbohydrate intake, um, then we become calorie deficient and we need to replace that deficiency with something else. And everyone's mind immediately jumps to meat. Mm. So when you hear low carb, the assumption is typically a high meat intake, especially mm. when you talk about keto. You can do a plant-based keto, but not many people do that. So what I tried, but it didn't really, uh, that didn't really go so well. <laughs> right, 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 right. So, uh, I started uh, adding in, sorry, maybe you wanted to. Oh, I just wanted to get some more sort of clarity then around where you've where you've landed now. Yeah, uh, where, so, uh, where, you, where you obviously I wouldn't have invited you on here if you uh, have some views that aren't based on any kind of science. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, you know, just explain where you've ended up. Yeah. So uh, one of the things then by by bit by accident, I think, um, because I was I used to eat a lot of meat, but in Belgium, we have a, like a no meat week or month that you can do um, or that used to be uh, a thing. And then I just, I just I thought, OK, let's do this. Let's try this. And immediately also felt better. Um, so I became plant based. I um, took meat out of my diet, uh, fish as well for the first um 
for a few for like six months i didn't eat any um um like uh, animal products um and went to um plant-based but quickly discovered that plant-based without like if you try to do a keto with plant-based that's not that's not a good idea <laughs> so I, I, eat, I eat a lot of beans uh chickpeas um all those kinds of um of carbs but plant-based carbs um i did start looking into supplements as well at that point because yeah i wanted to have enough um enough um of, of all the different macros in my in my diet and enough indeed like you say enough calories to be able to, to to do my sports and everything so it's quite active if you sport every if you do exercise every day then you need a lot of, of food as well um because otherwise yeah energy is a bit deficient um so that i've ended up now with uh, a plant-based um regimen or i eat um, um plant-based and uh, i do incorporate some fish mostly fatty fish um, also for the omega threes, um, and to keep that uh, those levels um, up, um, but it's mostly like salad with sardines um, or stuff like that, um, which I find that that works well uh, for me. Um, yeah, I also tried intermittent fasting for a while. Um, I'm not a real breakfast eater, so I have to force myself a little bit um, to eat breakfast. And then a salad with some fish in uh, for lunch, um, and maybe in the evening some more carbs. Like if, maybe in Belgium we eat, eat a lot of potatoes, right? I don't know if yes. that's like for you guys, but we eat a lot of potatoes, so I eat some potatoes and vegetables. Um, and also, yeah, the rest of the family um, is is not. We eat a lot more plant based, but they eat meat, so we try to try to be a bit more uh, aligned. And sometimes I just uh, eat the potatoes and the vegetables, and they have some meat on the side or something like that um but yeah that's that's a bit that's what i've landed on and that works that works really well uh for me yeah so a couple of things on that because i know some people in our community are, are um, really strictly plant-based and i just want to sort of say hey chill out a little bit here so if you mostly eat plants and you eat mm. a lot of diversity of plants mm. and you exercise like a crazy person like you are mm. then you can get away with from a strictly inflammation reduction or low inflammation viewpoint, you can get away with a little bit of fish here or there. Mm -hmm. So it's about having the vast majority of the intake being anti-inflammatory and microbiome supportive. Yeah. So, um, you know, what you're doing does not a conflict with what the research says, which mm. is that if you're eating more than 30 plants a week, then you have a healthy microbiome. Mm. And if you have a healthy micro, well, it, it sets you up to have a healthy microbiome. You can still mm. have problems, but it's definitely in your favor. So um, my message is personally to go as much plants as you possibly can, because we're up against yep. the greatest evil, greatest challenge, whatever you want to say. But if you exercise at the level that you do, which is most days intensely, right? Mm. This is mm. not the average person with inflammatory arthritis. They do not oh. do that. Mm. You have a different paradigm in your life than the average person from mm. which they do the studies and they conduct the meta-analysis and show Absolutely. that mostly plants is best, okay? Mm. So- um, you know, you are consistent with the studies because exercise is so powerful as an anti-inflammatory mm. that, Absolutely. you know, you can have a few little extras in your diet there and has no impact whatsoever. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be honest, if it, it does, sometimes I do get like a sort of a, sometimes it's a little worse, the AS, sometimes it's better. Uh, when it's worse, I do cut back. I just go full plant-based. I, I don't eat um, some of the other foods. Um, and then you you notice, okay, if I do this for a couple of weeks, then then it subsides again. So it, it's a bit it's a bit seeing where you are at what point. Um, but you can go a bit stricter or or maybe a bit less strict. In my opinion, that's that's what I what I do. Um, and and I used to in the few years ago, I was very strict as well. So never in on a, in a restaurant or when I went to family or never, never ate anything that wasn't on my list. Like, so everything plant based, very, very strict. I've sort of come back from that because I think it's also important to just be able to, you know, have a nice meal with family 
and not be the one that has to really re- bring his own food all the time. And I mean, and indeed, because I do the exercise and because I do some other things, I can from time to time just eat what everybody else. I don't still don't eat meat, but I mean, you can just join the rest of the family, eat a piece of cake. I, I mean, it's it's like not not really. Of course, you don't have to do that every day, but you can do one piece of cake once in a while. I mean, don't be the guy at birthdays that doesn't want to eat cake. Yeah, I mean, it's more its more like go exercise, go do something every day. And then if you have one piece of cake, fine. That's the perfect clip for this episode. The perfect yeah, clip for this episode is yeah. you saying go exercise because it, it is the highlighted point for ankylosing spondylitis. Absolutely. If you're watching this and you have ankylosing spondylitis, if you were to take nothing else away, it is exercise your little butt off. That is what you need to do. Um, And then if you do that, then all of the little delicacies or all the little sort of sensitivities around the dietary side of things drop way down. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, I exercise most days. My boy's birthday is coming up in nine days. We're counting it down. And, uh, and and I'm definitely having cake on his birthday. And I can do that because of the same reasons that we are currently discussing mm. that enable you to have a piece of cake from time to time as yep. well. Mm. So I want to ask you this. So let's stay on diet for a little while. Does it? How are you with oils? Have you noticed a reaction to oils? Talk oils with us. Yeah. Um, so I think it definitely plays a big role for me, mostly in the prepackaged foods, right? So the rapeseed oils, all the different kinds of sunflower oils, very prominent in the foods in the supermarkets, as you undoubtedly know, I started looking at this really closely. Um, like I said, I, I like cookies. I cut those out because there's a lot of bad stuff in there not just the sugar, but also the oils and stuff. Um, Luckily, I think in Belgium, we have kind of a, a, a nice culture around food. It's mostly, uh, it's very, it can be very fatty, but it's mostly like butter, a lot of butter and stuff like that. But we don't have a lot of the, the like the rapeseed oils or the oil stuff is not so prominent in Belgium. It is in the prepackaged foods, but not in like the cuisine or the cooking. Um, and I'm also very, very happy to say that um, I come from a family and, and I think in Belgium, most people, we cook right so we're used to cooking for ourselves so every day we try to make a meal that's a healthy meal but my father is like has always taught us you know uh cook for yourself it wasn't really not even a lesson it was something that was obvious was always like that it's in it's in the family history you know it used to be they had their own vegetable garden they even yeah i know it's a bit bit tricky but they slaughtered their own uh chickens cows i mean we have a lot of farmers here um used to be all very close by so the the local produce um was something that was very typical has started to change now because of course yeah everybody's working more and you have to go to the supermarket for your stuff but also a bit of a the the tradition is coming back of using the local local produce i use olive oil a lot because that works for me i like that um and also for the for the fatty uh, parts of my diet but that's about it. And I try to cut out all of the other oils. Um, I did notice, like I said, the prepackaged things when I cut those out. And when you start looking, it's like the mayonnaise, um, the the dressings on the salads. It's, it's really, really bad. I mean, I'm shocked that people are allowed to sell this kind of thing because, yeah, it's so, so bad for you. And it's not even real food anymore. I mean, psh, yeah. That, yeah. That's really, it's like kind of a pet peeve for me and I, I annoy a lot of people with it, but yeah, especially my family who like, uh, but I try to make my own mayonnaise with just, you know, the eggs and the, and the, uh, the olive oil, which is of course also not very, not that healthy, but better than the stuff from the store. So we try to make a lot of stuff ourselves. That's basically, if you try to make cook for yourself, um, find some local produce uh, farmers that we know that we have here uh, that we get our, our vegetables from um yeah that 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 is but uh what we try to focus on and the oils i try to keep that out as much as possible except for the olive oil okay yeah right so um the interesting there's a few interesting things about the processed foods so the re- a couple of reasons why they're so bad um i like the metaphor of having a, do you ever play golf? 
Have you ever played golf? Uh, once or twice, yes. I tried it. Yeah. So in a golf course, there is a par three, a par four, and a par five. Uh, the par five is a very long distance between where you hit the ball and where the hole is that you're trying to get the ball into. It's a right. very long distance, right? Mm. So if you think of processed foods, that is uh, sorry, and if we think of our target, and I, it's a little bit too graphic, but the hole is quite a good metaphor because it's where we want yeah. the food to get out the other end <laughs> if we're talking, right? Sure, so sure. if we tee off at the tongue and the hole is at the other end, mm. we need our food to go all the way down the long par five and get right to the other end. And that is fiber. We need fiber to get yes. to the very end, okay? Mm. If we're eating processed food, all that is is just hitting a shot that's not even get you to the hole in a path mm. three. It just burns before it even gets more than halfway through the small intestine. Mm. So you're starving your microbiome. There's no food for the gut bacteria that going to pro provide mm. the substances that are going to help you have reduced leaky gut and a healthy microbiome. Okay. So, so the first thing with the processed foods is you're not feeding the part of the body that needs to be fed. Mm. The second thing is, uh, uh, you know, the lack of actual nutrients in there. So the macronutrients, like the vitamin C, which rheumatoid arthritis patients are deficient, deficient in, uh, and any of the other polyphenols, again, which are anti inflammatory. So we've got nothing in the processed food. And mm. then thirdly, and this is where, you know, you touched upon the oils, all the oils in the processed foods are not only rich in omega-6, which is pro-inflammatory, mm but they're also oxidized because they've been yep. sitting in like they've been sitting on shelves forever and so they've been oxidized and as a result they're very rich in free radicals so you've got a free radical nutrient deficient microbiome depleting inflammatory food okay. so hence don't eat them okay yeah. so <laughs> So it's good that you've cut all that stuff out. And as I'm learning more from you, of course, we you know, we spend five minutes chatting before this, and mm. then we learn a lot as we go here. Yeah, you know, it sounds like in your family, and this is just observation, not judgment. But you know, if your mum's got some autoimmunity going on, your dad's got some autoimmunity because psoriasis and autoimmune condition, and then you've been born and and as an early teenager developed some symptoms as well. You know this 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 stuff sort of stirring up these symptoms. You know, so the more that you can be a shining light yeah. for the family and and help them with their foods, I think everyone will everyone will benefit because uh, there's some consistent themes. Yes, absolutely, and it's also something that I, I recognized for myself and in the family. More people have have sort of these problems, and I tried I, I do try to be a bit evangelical if i don't try i just talk about it all the time so uh <laughs> it's uh it's something that I've, I've become a bit of a i don't know if they they find it annoying or not but something i come I, I talk about very very much to them as well because it helped me so much you know and i don't want to see them with all these problems all the time and, and i do see that that it does in fact affect their lives as well and these these solutions are not it's not that difficult to do this right it's it's not so hard there's an, it's not a not a thing that you have to it's just move eat well make sure your your health is is good um and basically this is why i was always frustrated with the medical profession a bit because they always started with the drugs right so they just also my my mother as well they just gave her drugs and then it was yeah take the drugs my mother's very obstinate so she never wanted to do this she was like no nah, 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 i don't want to take too many drugs and we had a um, a family doctor when I was little that described this in a, a very good way. I thought he said, "Your health is like a bucket, and uh, if you keep your health bucket full with all of the things that are good for you, then uh, like the rheumatoid or the the rheumatoid arthritis or the AS is only going to be a small part of your bucket, and you won't feel it that much. It won't be that present. If all of the other stuff is not there, then the bucket is full with your AS." So make sure this health bucket is is really really well uh, filled with all of the other things, and then it won't be that much of a problem. It'll always be there, but it's only a bit, a small part of your of your uh, of your day to day life. And I, I always this I came, this came back to me when I was thinking about the health thing, and and all the things that I try to do now, and and that's just what I'm, I try to optimize everything just so the AS is the smallest part of the bucket as possible. <laughs> 
So that's that's a bit of the that's the approach um, for me. And I try to yeah, I try to help other people with that as well. So just I was also I think the CrossFit with that the community around it. A lot of people are are focused on their health there. Uh, that helps a lot as well for me. So just being in, in, it's like, yeah, you know, I think you probably know this, the, the five people that are, are around you the most are the ones that influence you the most. So these these are all healthy people in my case. All, all of them are, we always talk about these things. Um, and that that helps a lot as well. So the, the community around you is so, so important for me as well. I love that. Um, I watched a presentation at a conference that i was hosting in a different capacity i was a you know hired as an mc which is sort of another career that i have which is hosting events and doing entertainment and stuff and i was sitting down watching the presenter that i'd introduced uh, at this conference and thought this will be interesting he's talking about what influences success mm. he's a neurosurgeon a mm. brain expert Mm-hmm. And uh, he uh, has a uh, uh, sort of career in coaching high-performance sporting athletes mm-hmm. and helping them get that extra 1% to get the first place instead of third place. Mm-hmm. And he ran all of the analysis on what skill sets or attributes across the whole spectrum give you the most likelihood of success. And, mm-hmm. uh, and he had a list on the screen and ask the audience to have a guess in their mind which one. And the options were things like education, um, uh, family, wealth, um, um, uh, location of upbringing, and so on. And there was about 20 things on the screen. Mm -hmm. And we all thought in our head and thought about what it would be. And he revealed the number one contributor to likelihood of success was the community surrounding you and their shared vision of the outcome that you want. Mm. And so uh, in the case of Formula One drivers, he explained, which is an area that he spent a lot of time, is that if the if the pit crew and the guys that give you the information over the headsets, the guys that change the tyres, the research engineers, and if mm. everyone along with the driver all worked together closely as a team and were friends and you know basically mm-hmm. had the same shared vision they had the greatest success over the fastest cars and everything mm-hmm. so that ties in with being in that community around your crossfit community who are all mm-hmm. like-minded you know this is powerful stuff and it's why mm-hmm. i set up our rheumatoid support platform where mm-hmm. all of us inside that support group all have the same vision which is maximum health minimum symptoms and mm. it's catching you you yeah. rise up to the level of your peer group just mm. as you do at the gym absolutely yeah i totally agree with that yeah i think it's one of the most important things to do and for me stress is also something that's very very much kicks my ass into uh into being so um i think the the community and the fact that I feel good with them is also for me an anti-inflammatory. I mean, that works really, really well. Um, it's just something I, in fact, it's, it's the moving as well, but my wife always says, if I've not been to do like the CrossFit for like three, four days, it's like, get out of here because you're annoying me. Uh, you need, uh, you need your dose. So it's like, I, it's such an effect on me. It's really, really powerful. What um, happens uh, when you've, feel stressed uh, because this is something that a lot of us can relate to but are you able to articulate or have you have you found patterns Uh, does it result in more back pain or is it just the emotional side of things can you see if you can answer that for me as best you can yes it does result the two the two things are true for me so it does result in more back pain I do feel in periods of stress that it's 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 heavier for me. I have less energy. I feel more. Yeah, it's it's more like a how do I, how do I say it? more like stiffness. The stiffness is worse. Um, it's not pain. It's it's insane, but I, I feel it. You know, everything is like cramped, and my muscles get more cramped, and everything is is. It's like the stress really just it tightens me up, right? Um, and then if if I have my routine. 
I can I can manage this, right? Then I, then it's then it's okay. Then I can I can sort of um, offset the stress symptoms. But sometimes I have to do a little more exercise, a little more yoga uh, to offset it. Um, and then the emotional part is is for me as well. I, I notice that I I get a bit short, so I I, I tend to not 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 angry, but I tend to be like a chip on your shoulder. Like I tend mm-hmm. to to be more eh, like shorter with my kids and shorter with with everything is a bit more difficult to deal with. Let's say. Um, mm. So that's that's definitely an effect for me also because if I notice the for a really long time and that's something I've I've now just started let's say for a really long time the AS for me was um, like how do I how do I explain it's a problem I wanted to solve I needed to solve and I saw it as something outside of myself. And something that if when it kicks in and when it gets worse, I get angry because, you know, I'm doing all these things and why does it happen again? And I'm I'm always trying to optimize. So why do I, why does it, why is it there again? And stuff like that. Um, what I've noticed or what I'm trying, but it's very difficult for me is to accept it. Just see it as it's a part of myself. Um, and if it, kicks up it's maybe a signal to me to say hmm, something is wrong maybe you should optimize or look at something is there a, it's a, it's just a signal it's it's a thing that that shows you something maybe it's sort of a guide even for me <laughs> it's a really weird way to describe it but um yeah it, it I, but that's that's definitely not something I'm, I'm i've worked through yet it's that's really just yeah something i'm i'm trying to to yeah, modulate or, or think about it in a different way. And hopefully, I think that meditation for me has, has definitely been one of the things that, that, that help as well. Um, so to keep the stress down also, but yeah, breath work, meditation, I find very, very powerful. Um, that helps me a lot in managing um, the AS as well. Um, yeah, so that's, that's uh, sorry, I, I may have gone off track here, but- No, that's great. That's, um, when- um- how uh, committed to meditation and breath work are you, and when do you do them, and how often? Yeah, that's that's part of my. I try to do a routine. I've also noticed if I make this a routine, it's a lot easier. Um, so it's basically a daily routine. Uh, when I get up in the morning, um, yeah, I'll just describe everything I do, right, and then you can just say what you what you think is interesting. Uh, when I get up, I, the first thing I do is I drink a liter of water with some salt in it um, to rehydrate. And then um, I go outside to get some light in my eyes. Um, and if the weather allows, I will do a half hour of yoga outside. Um, if not, I'll do it inside. Um, and that really has helped me just to start my day without the, the stiffness and uh, just alleviate that part of it. And then after the the yoga, I do um, like it's like five minutes of, of breath work, five to ten minutes of breath work, um, and I meditate. I try to meditate for also ten minutes, something like that. Doesn't always, to be honest, doesn't always succeed in the morning, but I try to to incorporate it at that point, and that really does give me a form of being ready for the day. Right? If I don't if I don't do this, then I just notice that the rest of the day is sort of off. Um, and then most days I, I then, um, yeah, the kids wake up and we have breakfast and, uh, I bike, uh, my daughter to school. So I go with her. So that's also a bit of movement already. So I do like 20 minutes of biking, uh, which I like. Um, and then, uh, usually in the evening I, uh, I go to CrossFit. I do an hour of CrossFit or I've now have some stuff, some, um, like a weightlifting bar and stuff at my home, or I do an hour at home. Uh, so I'm always, most days I do some form of, of exercise, usually uh, the CrossFit or the weightlifting um, part, which I, I found through CrossFit, the weightlifting, and is really, really, I really, really like it. It's something that I'm, I'm very, uh, very much into now. Um, also because I sort of have this reflex of, 
uh, the AS is not going to beat me. I'm going to beat it. I know that's not the best way to deal with it, but you know, I can do this. I can lift 200 kilos despite the AS, you know, that's sort of the, the mindset. Um, so that, and then I, I, in the evening, um, I tried to do a bit of breath work before going to sleep. So calming down, um, like a four, seven, eight, um, count of, of breathing, um, or some yoga nidra. Um, before going to bed, um, I try to go to bed on time. You know, sleep is very, very important for me, but that's one of the biggest things I, I have to work on. You know, I, I tend to go to bed a bit too late, but I try to get seven, seven and a half hours of sleep, um, which that's might might be better if I got some more. But that's basically if I can do that, then then I'm then I'm good. So that's basically those are basically a lot of the tools and then uh, in the morning i also take some supplements just to try and do like the five percent optimizing that i can still do um so i have some omega-3s some magnesium um some curcumin vit vitamin c vitamin d um yeah i told you before that i am now also involved with a supplement company um tyrannos and one of the things that they uh, make is a supplement that has the curcumin, the boswellia, the vitamin C in really high doses. So one of the, the supplement issues, I think, is that most for most supplements, they're made for, yeah, with, all, with maybe a stupid term for normal people. <laughs> not, not, yeah, not that we're abnormal, but, but we need more. I think we need more of, of certain things. And um, this supplement is, high do is higher dosed. So for me, that works really well um, to to just the few percentages that I, I can add to the, the health bucket, like I explained. Um, yeah, and then um, I take a cold shower. I forgot about that. And I, I like to, so after the, the breath work in the morning, I take a cold shower. Um, yeah, those are, I think those are the, almost all of the things I try to do. Um, and then uh, for me, during the day, it's like, I sitting down is is what activates my my back pain as well uh, a lot we try to move a lot during the day just i stand up a lot i walk a lot i always tell people when i'm in meetings guys i'm gonna stand up it's not because i don't i'm not interested but i focus better when i stand uh so i don't try to sit too much i try to move around during the day as a lot as well a lot as well um yeah so those are a few of the things that i i try to to do uh try to look at uh, daily, basically. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I um, would love it if uh, actually future guests could do that and go through their days just like you have. I think mm. that's really valuable. And one might even ask guests to start with that in the future because that could be a great launching pad for then expanding on uh, each of those things. A lot of them we've already covered. You know, we've mm. talked about yoga, and then you've got you well exercise in general, mm. breath, and uh, your uh, CrossFit uh, and movement. Um, you've added to that the uh, the meditation, breath work, the four seven eight. That's not complicated, folks. If you're wondering what that breath work is, you simply breathe in for four for count of four, and then hold your breath for a count of seven, and then out for a count of eight. That's what mm. you do. You said in the evening. In the mm. morning, is your breath work the same, or is it more aggressive, Wim Hofy no. style? Yeah, it's more aggressive. Again, not to push some kind of, of sort of breath work or anything, but I came into it with the Wim Hof breath work. Um, so it's just a super oxygenating uh, breathing. Also, because there's a link there with him and, and rheuma, rheumatoid as well. Yeah. Did the research in the Radboud Universiteit in, in Holland um, with the, his breathing. And um, it showed that um, they were able to offset some of the effects. Not they don't know if it's long term or not, but I figure mm -hmm. what the hell if it doesn't, uh, uh, it won't hurt me. So and I do like it because it gives me energy in the morning, right? So it it uh, basically gives you a lot of adrenaline, um, which fires up your immune system, of course. But it also gives me energy to start my day. Uh, so I do Wim Hof breathing usually, um, or some form of super oxygenative breathing. Um, but it can also be like box breathing is also uh, nice in the morning, I think. Um, so just count of four and then four in, hold for four, four out, um, yeah, four out. And so just four, uh, counts of box breathing. I like that as well in the morning. Um, yeah. And then during the day, sometimes I don't know, do you know, Andrew Huberman? 
think the whole world maybe knows him, but uh, yeah, I know uh, who you're talking about. Uh, Stanford, uh, uh, Stanford guy who's got a huge following and yeah, um, scientist. Yeah, scientist. He has like yeah. um, a, a very short way of of resetting, let's say, or, or activating your parasympathetic. Is like a, a parasympathetic sigh, is what he calls it. It's just like a like this. So breathe in, another short breath in, and then breathe out. And do that for like three three times or so. And I do that during the day. Sometimes when I feel stress coming up or feel like ah something is annoying me, I use that to to regulate a bit. Um, but basically, any any breath work that uh, that allows you to breathe out longer than you breathe in will activate your parasympathetic, and that helps to offset the stress. So, do you have any um, performance monitoring gear like a Whoop or one of these uh, Aura rings or anything like yeah. that? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit uh, analytical in that respect and a geek too, uh, so I like my gadgets. Um, I have an Aura ring to track my sleep. Um, specifically because I wanted to work on the deep sleep. Um, I have uh, a Garmin watch for the sports and also to track my HRV. So I, I also looked at the the, H, the effect on HRV a lot uh, for a lot of these tools that I use. Um, that and then I used a CGM, so a glucose monitor for a while, just to see if that had, had any effect. Um, yeah, those those are the main uh, monitors that I use. Yeah, I got a question for you with your Garmin watch, um, yeah. and let me just explain the, the acronym there. So HRV, folks haven't come across that before, stands for heart rate variability, and the uh, heart rate variability correlates with parasympathetic nervous system, and so. Mm -hmm. If we can track heart rate variability using a device which can sense that in your body by being physically connected to your heartbeat, we can then infer from that what your parasympathetic nervous system is like. Now, why does this matter? Well, there was a study that I shared on a, either a YouTube short or Instagram or as a regular YouTube video, I can't remember which one, but it was definitely a social media clip um, where they analyzed the uh, the effects of heart rate variability on people with rheumatoid arthritis and found that it was a predictor of remission rates for people on biologic drugs. So this is like a profound insight is that if you took heart rate variability data and then use that, you could tell before the person went on the biologic drug whether or not they would hit remission or not to a, to a pretty high accuracy, to around about 80%. And so what we're talking about here is a huge influencing factor into the likelihood of medications working and likely inflammation um, maintaining uh, at that at a low level. So with all that sort of pre-frame, can you tell us whether or not your heart rate variability, you've been able to see any correlations between it and inflammation levels because I, um, somewhere in one of these drawers, and you've caught me on the hop because I didn't know we were going to talk about this, but I've recently bought myself a whoop uh, band yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, I, um, I've i just been get, getting it set up in the last few days and I, I wore it a bit a few times before I actually... Uh, realized that uh, uh, I hadn't, you know, charged the thing up and got it ready to accumulate data. So um, I'm going to start looking at this myself. But what have you found? I'm curious. Yeah, I, actually, I, I tracked it quite diligently for, for a few months. Um, so and I found that if I am um more stressed and there's more like i don't sleep enough um and then then also correlates with more uh discomfort from my from my back pain um that my hrv is definitely lower um so the higher the better um and um i can definitely see the effect of some adverse things like not sleeping enough is a big one um, I've also, I've been basically, I, I think so, or my doctors have said I've been in remission for a few years now, basically. Um, and I 
do think that the level of health that you try to aspire to helps with that. And sometimes when I feel like, okay, I haven't slept enough, um, I've maybe gone um, drinking with some friends and, and uh, I try to cut out alcohol as much as I can as well, because that has a very negative effect on, on the HRV part um, and also on my general disease uh, management. Um, but it does really give me sort of a compass to see, okay, I need to do a bit more maybe a bit more breath work a bit more exercise i've been a bit negligent with some things and now i can see the downward uh trend in the hrv as well uh when i'm when i'm sick definitely so not as but not, you can see it plummeting immediately and even a few days before you get sick you can uh, you can see that um so for me it's definitely something that's interesting to follow to see okay what's happening with that what can i maybe do maybe okay it's a signal that i have to maybe do a few things a bit better or i've i've yeah been a bit lacking in some some respects and usually I, I know pretty quickly what i've done or not done that i need to uh to improve so i think that's a very interesting um um yeah like uh data to to have and to follow a bit yeah yeah great and well, i haven't i haven't used the whoop band myself but i hear good things about it um some friends of mine uh have it on the in the crossfit uh box um yeah i just i went with the aura ring because it's a bit more uh, supposedly it parses a bit more data than uh the uh the whoop specifically for sleep but um i use a, a um i've to just to measure the hrv i've used a breast um a sort of a chest band um because that's more accurate and then linked it to the watch to in the morning see okay watch my what is my hrv level at this point did that for a few months just to be able to get like a baseline um and then know when it's up or when it's down mm. it's great it's something that um i'll probably talk about more on the podcast down the track so if people are interested in this then uh, let me know because i might um you know share data around what i'm learning myself about mm. correlating my sleep and my uh heart rate variability and any other things so, so if you if you if you're interested in, in tracking this, then um, definitely interesting to also maybe set your baseline with uh, the chest um, band, because they would they work they both work yeah. But it's like the um, on your arm, it's never going to be exactly accurate. So I use it as um, uh, um, a uh, it's it's I I just compare it to all the data from my from my arm, let's say. Um, it's not so that's not exactly accurate accurate but you can see trends mm. right and if you want to do, be a bit more accurate use the chest band to set your baseline and then from now on, and from time to time do that again to see okay where are we going with it uh but the the arm so the the measurement on your on your wrist is fine to see the trends yeah gotcha absolutely yeah to see the direction of uh, how things yeah. are going yeah mm. well Thanks, Simon. This has been fabulous. So we've, uh, you know, if I could list some of the things that you've mentioned, and we've talked exercise, diet, stress reduction, acceptance, and feeling like it's providing lessons and not sort of trying to push back against the signals if there's if there's some pain, having a really, really good daily routine mm -hmm. behind this so that everything gets done in the day that needs to be done for your health. Um, and then trying to uh, work on sleep and measuring things that matter like heart rate variability. Um, and of course, in your daily routine, the things like getting the early morning sunlight to set your circadian rhythm yeah. um, and your breath work, which you do twice a day and meditation and some supplements there. You know, does this kind of, do you feel like we've 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 covered Simon? in an hour here do you feel yeah. like we've we've unpacked what we wanted to cover yeah i think so i think it's for me the most important thing is and that's a bit of the frustration i had with the with the doctors is don't just sit still and accept this move exercise go outside go out going outside is also one of the things that i wanted to stress go into nature i mean go take walks um go into the forest that also helps amazing that's also amazing for it it's just for the stress but also 
just I, I don't know the anti-inflammatory aspects of of nature and forests and this, the air that's there I, i'm not scientific i can't explain scientifically i know it's beneficial i know there's science about it as well i don't i can't really tell you how but it works so just go exercise outside go run out outside do stuff outside with your family or we got a dog uh, during COVID, <laughs> like maybe a lot of people but also amazing you just go outside and walk the dog twice a day it's it's fantastic you'd get movement it's nice to be outside so if it's a, if there's a tip that are people that say ah, exercise is not for me get a dog walk your dog twice a day it's it'll help you amazingly um so that that i think we did cover most of the things i, I think Maybe one thing I, I would want to mention is we, we covered like relationships and community. The AS sort of forced me to go to focus on myself a lot, right? Because I had this pain. I had this thing that I need to solve. I, I, I was always thinking about my disease. Um, so what this health journey has allowed me to do now is maybe shift that externally more towards being there for my family, being there for the kids, um, not always on the focus on on myself, which is also which which also helps a lot to not think about it all the time. Just focus on them and be with them and do stuff with them. Yeah, I think that's that's. I think in the first part of your disease, it's easy to just go, "Oh, woe is me," and and I have this terrible thing. Yes, of course you do, um, but there's a lot of things that you can do about it, and then if you do those things it'll sort of fade into the background partly not always but partly that's a great one contribution yeah that's the word yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. contribution yeah, yeah. And I, that's, I think that's I maybe to... yeah i know i know you're great on you're big on this and and thank you again for what you've done but i think helping other people with these things like you said my family uh, but also my friends or, or other just being able to give this advice to other people and help them is also something that I want to do a lot more in the future. And that that is definitely feels like will help me as well. Just sharing this knowledge, maybe even a bit of breathwork coaching um, or yeah, helping people with some exercises. I mean, that's that definitely makes me feel good as well. There's definitely a need for it. And whilst what I've observed is that the same things that work for rheumatoid work for ankylosing spondylitis, yeah. work for psoriatic arthritis. And having said that, people want to preferably hear from someone with the exact diagnosis that mm. they have. Uh, and so, you know, if you uh, if you were to be able to, um, you know, offer those things you mentioned to specifically ankylosing spondylitis community of which there are plenty of people mm. um then that would be of of high value so certainly things to look at in the future mm. and um i think that uh you know that that obviously presses a few buttons for you gets you excited so go for it mm. go for it yeah thanks um Thank you so much for for communicating all this with us. It's really been a pleasure to have a chat with you. Um, we uh, we got from you that you do work for a supplement company, but um, before we hit record, we said let's not even even go there because we do not want this to appear in any way like a no. push towards that company. I mm. didn't even realize that before we set up this podcast. However, um, those supplements do sound good. So what we'll do, we'll put a link on the um, blog page that this episode will end up being posted to, which yep. will be over at rheumatoidsolutions.com forward slash blog, and then just put in the search term Simon, and this will come yep. up. Um, so if you are interested in those supplements, uh, take a look at them. We'll put a link there that has no affiliates, nothing like that, just a website link. Mm -hmm. And other than that, I just want to say thank you and keep up the great work. And uh, yeah. Great stuff. Yeah, the same for you. Thank you very much. Uh, I really, as I said, I appreciate what you do and what you put out in the world. And um, yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me and letting me share my story. It was a great experience for me.